Hello, I'm Christopher Preble. I'm co-director of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security's New American Engagement Initiative. And I'd like to welcome you today to our discussion on the in our future foreign policy series. The Scowcroft Center works to develop sustainable nonpartisan strategies to address the most urgent security challenges facing us today. And NAEI is a special unit formed last year that seeks to challenge prevailing assumptions governing US foreign policy and help policymakers manage risks, set priorities, and allocate resources wisely and efficiently. The Future Foreign Policy Series aims to foster discussions around these underlying assumptions, drawing in voices from a range of different perspectives. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Wendy Cutler, Vice President at the Asia Society Policy Institute, in conversation with Nick Wadhams, Senior Foreign Policy Reporter at Bloomberg News, on the future of US trade policy. Ms. Cutler is uniquely qualified to speak on this topic. She led negotiations on the Trans-Pacific Partnership and served nearly three decades as a diplomat and negotiator in the office of the US Trade Representative. Wendy also possesses deep knowledge of East Asia, which is of particular importance given its centrality to the global economy. As for Nick Wadhams, he has written extensively on US policy towards China, including on issues related to trade and commerce. Wendy and Nick, thank you again for sharing your expertise with us today. As the United States slowly emerges from our COVID-induced coma and the US economy begins to pick up, this is the perfect moment to discuss the state of US trade strategy and how US trade relations fit into the Biden administration's broader foreign policy. I'm particularly interested to know what a successful and sustainable US trade policy would look like in light of the Biden administration's pledge to pursue a foreign policy for the middle class. Can we also have a trade policy for the middle class? I look forward to hearing Wendy's thoughts on this matter. And lastly, before I forget, thank you viewers for joining us for this event. If you have a question you'd like to ask Wendy, please submit using the Q&A function on Zoom or tweet your question to at AC Scowcroft. And with that, over to you, Nick. Chris, thanks very much. Um, Wendy, very excited to, uh, to speak with you today. And I have all sorts of questions uh, for you. But first, I wanted to start off with a little bit of breaking news. Um, earlier today, China announced that it was extending some tariff exclusions for US imports for, for a certain set of imports, including some uh, rare earths ore and gold ore. Um, at the same time, you had the US and the EU both announcing uh, in a statement that they were um, going to uh, put new pressure on China. They said they want to hold countries like China that support trade distorting policies to account. So you have two new messages today that seem to run slightly counter to each other. And I was just hoping we could start by having you put these two statements in their proper context and particularly my question on the China announcement is, does this signal a sort of concession from China or perhaps perhaps a, 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 an olive branch to the United States to start uh, a new round of trade talks? Well, thanks, Nick, and you're right. It's been a busy day already today on the trade front. So let's start with the China announcement. I mean, I think it's a welcome development, but I would not read too much into it for two reasons. First, the exclusions that have been extended over a longer time frame by China apply to a limited number of products. I think it's 79 products out of thousands or tens of thousands of products um, on which tariffs are already applied. And second, um, I haven't seen the list, but I'm assuming these are products um, that are in the interest of China um, to relax the tariffs on because despite what President Trump said, it's the importers, it's China that's paying the tariffs that it's imposing against US imports. And so again, welcome development, but I wouldn't read too much into it. Now, with respect to the announcement, um, the joint announcement by um, USTR Thai, Secretary of Commerce and um, the EU Trade Commissioner, um, I think that's a welcome announcement but also no surprises here. Um, the key um, action forcing um, reason for this announcement was that the EU was poised to increase their tariffs against US imports on June 1. 
And through this announcement, they have said they're going to suspend those tariffs as both sides try to work on a solution with respect to global overcapacity on steel and aluminum. Okay, so taking it sort of from the more granular approach to a, a 30,000 foot level, do you see this administration sharpening its trade policy toward China? Do you see a more coherent policy emerging, a, a little more meat on the bone? Uh, Catherine Tai has said she wants to meet with her counterpart uh, from China at some point relatively soon, though we don't have a date for that yet. So are you seeing that policy take shape both for China and more broadly for, for the Asia Pacific, or do you think they're still working through it? Well, clearly the Biden administration's trade policy is still a work in progress. And let's be honest, the focus is really on domestic issues right now, whether it be COVID recovery or economic recovery or infrastructure. And so I think we're seeing the most movement on trade in areas where trade aligns very closely with these domestic priorities. So whether it be climate change or COVID recovery or supply chains, that's where we're seeing kind of the most traction. But that said, I also think we're seeing a much more kind of thoughtful policy already, um, one that's based on working with allies and partners with the administration seemingly in no rush to engage with China until they really figure out um, their overall policy with the trade component being one part of an overall strategic policy towards China. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned the allies and partners because this has really struck me as one element that's uh, that's a fundamental tension in, in the trade policy that the Biden administration has articulated so far where on the one hand, they, they say repeatedly, both on trade and foreign policy, and, and essentially every every aspect of their approach to the world is that we want to work with allies and partners. Yet at the same time, uh, it, the president himself in his speech to Congress said, hey, buy American. And he was very explicit that uh, he sees uh, competition in the 21st century uh, as a real uh, battle royale almost with China, um, uh, that, that these are two systems working for supremacy uh, in, in the world. Um, so how do, you, how do you think that this administration will resolve what appears to be that tension where obviously working with allies and partners would seem to lead you down one avenue for a particular trade strategy, but if you're then turning around and telling Congress and the world uh, to buy American, uh, that's something that would seemingly um, alienate or potentially be an avenue of, of concern for allies and partners. And that's a great, a great question. And I, I agree with you. I think there is some built in tension here, whether it be the administration pushing for reshoring um, of jobs back to the United States, or whether it's with respect to pursuing buy American policies. So the administration is going to have to navigate very carefully um, and make sure that in doing so, it doesn't alienate our allies and partners. And that can be done. For example, on Buy America, um, you know, we have certain obligations to our trading partners, but most of our government procurement is not covered by um, you know, international obligations. So with respect to those non-covered procurements, we can up to, you know, the Buy America restrictions. The question is, will we then cross over into those areas where we are now obligated to open those purchases up to foreign um, governments and foreign companies from, from those governments? And so that will have to be carefully um, navigated. I think the steel announcement that was made today also kind of underscores this underlying tension, although I think the, the um, both sides were able to find a way forward, at least for now. And that is, again, that the EU agreed not to go ahead with tariff increases, but the US committed to working with Europe to find a solution to the real problem that led to the tariffs, and that is global overcapacity. Um, they've given themselves, I think, to the end of the year to work out a solution on steel and aluminum with the EU, and we'll have to see how those negotiations proceed. Now, do you see in your in your conversations uh, and, and given your experience having negotiated some extremely thorny trade issues 
in the past, you know, it really strikes me that in the Trump administration, uh, the president often used tariffs almost as a as a coercive measure or a weapon uh, to say, okay, give us what we want. And if you don't, I'm going to slap tariffs on you. That was certainly the case with Turkey. Uh, you, you saw that uh, obviously with the European Union and France. Um, is there a loss of trust there that's, that the Biden administration simply won't be able to restore? It, it felt a little like the Trump administration was opening a Pandora's box where, where trade and, and tariffs were being used in new and uh, innovative uh, and potentially hostile ways. Is there enough trust to be able to negotiate uh, some of these really thorny uh, trade issues that that were likely to even when when the negotiations are likely to last years, you know, potentially uh, through 2024 into a new administration. Well, I think you put your finger on a, a great issue, and that is trust. And rebuilding trust takes time. And um, you know, we have a four-year presidential election cycle. And so um, the Biden team obviously is working very hard to restore our alliances, to rebuild trust, to re-enter um, and show leadership in some key international organizations. And I think a lot of our allies and partners welcome this, but also I, I think in the back of their minds, there's also kind of an uneasiness about where the United States might be in three and a half years. So I think that has led a lot of our allies and partners to really work on diversifying their trading partners and their economic partners. So they're not over-reliant on the United States should we in three and a half years embark on a, on a protectionist you know, trade policy. Well, that, that leads me actually right into the, my next question. And I know you had spent a lot of time working on this issue of a foreign policy for the middle class. Um, in my conversations with, with administration officials, they've been very clear to try to differentiate between foreign policy for the American middle class and America first, and, and try to assuage uh, concerns that a foreign policy for the middle class would essentially amount to protectionism. Um, how do you differentiate the two? Do you see a distinction or, or do, you, do you understand or have you spoken to other officials from other countries about their concerns that essentially a foreign policy for the middle class could, could amount to protectionism? Um, yes, and I have had these conversations and a number of countries do, you know, have expressed to me a concern. Does this mean protectionism? Does this mean, you know, buy America? Does this mean reshoring? Are we going to see more tariffs? And what I tried to explain to them, having been a member of the task force that worked on this Carnegie report for a number of years, that that this this approach is more about building domestic support in the United States for an international economic engagement strategy. And if we can build that support, we're going to be much more effective on the international scene. And again, I think there is a way to pursue a worker centric trade policy or a trade policy for the middle class without resorting to protectionism. That will be clearly, you know, some some folks in certain agencies may lean towards protectionist measures. But again, I think there's a way to do both at the same time, but it needs to be done very skillfully um, and in close consultation with our allies and partners. It, that, it's very interesting because it seems like one of the, the big test cases for that will be in the Indo-Pacific and uh, what this administration decides to do uh, around uh, the TPP or potentially trying to resuscitate uh, its participation in some form of trade agreement uh, uh, across uh, the Indo-Pacific region. Can you just give us a sense of, of where you see this administration headed? Um, is there, what can the U.S. really be doing in Asia short of rejoining uh, the TPP? Well, as much as I would personally like to see the United States return to some kind of TPP, and I recognize that if we were to return, it can't be the agreement as is. Updates would need to be made, revisions would need to be made, but I just don't think it's in the cards right now. And so I'm a pragmatic person, and my, um, you know, my feeling is we should 
now be pursuing narrower sectoral regional deals, get us back in the game in Asia, whether it be digital trade or secure supply chains or climate and trade, let's try and do some narrower initiatives, initiatives where we would not need congressional approval. And these, if successful, could be impactful in the region and may actually serve as building blocks towards an eventual, eventual, eventual return of the United States to some TPP-like agreement. It, it, it's, I guess the, the challenge there is that on the one hand, you have uh, obviously former President Trump and then uh, the, the left wing of, of the Democratic Party that was really pretty vehemently op opposed to TPP. And then you have a fair number of Republicans, uh, a, a great number of Republicans, and then uh, some Democrats who also uh, believe that there's a future for it. So do, do, are you still holding out hope that in some number of years time, we could actually get back to a TPP like formulation for, for the US trade, uh, US trade policy in the region? I think it's doable. Um, but again, I'm also realistic and I understand the challenges and I just don't see it happening now or next year um, or possibly not even within the next four years. But then again, that doesn't mean we can't engage. And so I think, you know, for me, I think it's so critical that the Biden team get back in the region economically um, by pursuing a, a more limited type of deal. Right. Um, I think if we wait too long, we're going to find ourselves increasingly on the outside as other countries, including China, but not just China, other countries write the rules without us. And we saw that in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Not only did they write rules among the 15 countries, but they now have a framework for addressing new issues as they appear in the region. And guess what? We're not gonna be invited to that table for those discussions. And right. that's, that's, that's problematic. That's a great concern to me and I hope to others. Um, and I hope that shows and demonstrates that we need to find a way to engage. So I want to turn to the USMCA, but before I do that, I want to ask you one more one more question about China. A huge uh, priority for this administration has been its supply chain review, uh, and this is uh, still underway. Um, an extremely complicated process that seems to boil down in large part to how uh, the U.S. can reorient its supply chain uh, away from China um, on all sorts of uh, products. So I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on how realistic you think it is that the U.S. could essentially decouple from uh, the world's second biggest or soon to be largest economy in the world. Do you think that decoupling the way that this administration or the Trump administration envisioned it is even possible given the degree to which these two economies are so intertwined? And as you mentioned, there are so many other countries in the world that uh, are not interested in picking sides that basically want to do business both with the United States and with China. Mm -hmm. So my view is that um, probably the way to go forward is what I would call selective decoupling. I think in certain technologies and other certain critical or essential products, some type of decoupling might be needed, but I think it's unrealistic to, to pursue a broad decoupling strategy particularly as you mentioned, when our allies and partners, they're not there with us. For most of them, China is their largest trading partner. And let's remember, China's now the engine of growth in the Asia, in the Asia Pacific region. So if anything, other countries in Asia are integrating more fully with China. Now that said, some do have concerns about being overly reliant on China. And in that regard are pursuing policies to attract some of the investment that is leaving China, as well as rewarding some of their companies or providing incentives for them to come home or to um, diversify their supply chains. So I would hope in, any, in the outcome of, of, these, um, of the supply chain reports for four key products that is expected, I guess, next month, that in addition to the United States providing some incentives for reshoring, we'll also see a focus on establishing secure supply chains 
working with like-minded countries and this coalition of countries could vary sector by sector or product by product depending on which companies from which countries are involved in these technologies or in these products. Um, and that would be kind of a key component of our supply chain policy. But, you know, a, a policy that, that, that is, that is um, based on decoupling or reshoring is just not realistic. It's not going to happen. Our companies are not going to do that. So I hope we're smart and nuanced and really um, use the leverage of working with other like-minded countries to achieve um, our objectives. So essentially what, what you seem to be saying as well is that, okay, you have this government level discussion messaging from all sides, but then obviously there are the companies that need to uh, do the actual trade. And, and it, it sounds like what you're saying is that those companies, that regardless of what, what government level officials would be saying, those companies are really not uh, eager. Or they, they very much want to keep up this trade and they're going to be resisting that pretty strongly. And again, it depends on the sector, it depends on the company, but the role of governments, governments can, can provide incentives for reshoring, governments can provide penalties for not coming back, but they can't really compel companies to operate somewhere um, if, if they choose not to. And frankly, you know, when you look at surveys coming out of some of the business associations in China, um, I'm always struck by how many U.S. companies, even with even through COVID and through the U.S.-China trade war, with continued tensions expected, how many U.S. companies are intent, you know, to keeping their operations in China, right. um, even with um, you know the risks I just mentioned. Right. So let me ask you um, if you could offer some some ideas or suggestions on how we could sort of see a worker centric trade policy be translated into real initiatives. Um, the USMCA was a, was a signature uh, event of the of the Trump administration. We've just heard there are going to be a USMCA talks today, in fact, but there's still a great deal of tension uh, between the US, uh, Canada and Mexico over certain elements. Of, uh, of their trade policies and, and the USMCA. Do you, do you see the USMCA as a model uh, for, um, for a, a more worker-centric trade policy? Is that something that the Biden, the Biden administration could build on? And do you think that uh, USMCA is serving its intended purpose? So first I would just say, um, in any trade agreement between three large economies like Canada, Mexico, and the United States, they're going to be implementation problems. Right. And part of the reason of these meetings, particularly at such a senior level, is to kind of head off disputes and try and resolve them. So it's not necessary to use the dispute settlement mechanisms. Now we've already seen the United States just went forward um, last week, late last week with their first labor enforcement case under the new rapid response mechanism. And I thought it was quite interesting if you read Ambassador Tai's statement when she announced this, she commended Mexico for, for really focusing on the problem in that plant. And she talked about working constructively with Mexico going forward. So I think that bodes well for the implementation of the USMCA. Look, there are gonna be problems um, and probably you know, Mexico and Canada are gonna find instances where they don't think the United States is living up to their obligations but I think that's kind of par for the course. But you know, back to your question, um, clearly um, the USMCA is being viewed, if not a model for a worker-centric trade policy, like a floor on which to build for a US-centric, um, worker-centric trade policy. Um, I'm of two minds here. I think um, you know, the fact that the Republicans and Democrats could come together and reach um, agreement on the content of USMCA and then sell it to Canada and Mexico and get it through Congress with an unprecedented bipartisan majority, mm -hmm. that is a huge accomplishment. And I don't think anyone you know, should lessen it. But now I'm gonna contradict myself right now. I also think that there were circumstances that were unique to the USMCA negotiation, which allowed for those results 
which particularly in my region of expertise, Asia, I don't see um, things duplicating themselves there. I think it's going to be a little more difficult to reach a USMCA type agreement in Asia. And what are those circumstances? Well, number one, Mexico and Canada export 75% of their goods and services to the United States. So they're very dependent on the US market, which means the US had a lot of leverage in the negotiation vis-a-vis -vis Canada and Mexico. And again, I mentioned in Asia, who's their number one trading partner for the most part for most countries in Asia? It's not the United States, it's China. And in fact, our share of trade with those countries is either um, head, um, keeping still, keeping steady, or actually declining as China's part of the pie is increasing. So that's number one. Number two, remember President Trump at that time was threatening that if, if Congress didn't agree to USMCA, not only was he not going to agree to, to USMCA, but he was going to get rid of NAFTA. And that would have like totally, um, you know, upended 20 years of relationships between companies. So that was a serious threat. Um, and um, finally, let's remember the Republican Congress, they agreed to a lot in the USMCA negotiation, including weakening the ISDS provisions, getting rid of the pharmaceutical um, IPR protections, two kind of must-haves un under TPP, where the Republicans were not happy with the agreement the Obama team brought home um, um, you know, with, with the other 11 Asian um, countries. So again, I think there's some unique circumstances there, but I think there's a lot we can learn from the USMCA. And I would just hope as we develop this worker-centric trade policy that we want to present to the rest of the world, that we don't do so in an insular type of way, that as we develop it, we kind of bounce some of these ideas off our trading partners so we don't lock ourselves into a policy that's dead on arrival with key trading partners. Okay, great. That's well, a long answer, you. sorry. It's, it's fantastic, it's very helpful. Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over now to Emma Ashford, uh, who's gonna take some questions from the audience. Thank you, Wendy. Great, thanks, Nick, and, and thank you, Wendy. This is this has been a really interesting conversation. Um, so um, please, if you would like to submit a question for Wendy, please do so um, by putting it into the Q&A function here on Zoom, um, and um, we look forward to seeing all your questions. Um, so, so I'm going to start with with a, a question that um, Chris rather alluded to in his, his introduction, but but I think is really interesting, um, and that's the notion that um, COVID um, and the last year under the, the pandemic conditions has perhaps taught us something about how resilient the global trade system is, um, that it functions pretty well in some cases, you know, that we've seen um, very quick development of vaccines. Um, but in other cases, um, you know, that system has failed. We've seen countries return to sort of uh, vaccine nationalism, trying to, to save things for themselves. And so I'm just curious what you think, um, you know, what, what has the last year um, helped us to discover about the way that the trade system works and will things look different going forward or has this just been an, an aberration and we'll just move on from, from COVID? Great question. I would just, um, just underscore this is all again like a work in progress so we don't know. Um, and let's just be honest, in the beginning of the pandemic, the trading, the world trade, global trading system did not work well. And what countries did right away was to impose export restrictions on that at that point on medical supplies, on medical equipment, ventilators, PPE. And it really led to a lot of bottlenecks and shortages um, and frankly, high prices for a lot of these goods. Now, over time, some of those export restrictions have been relaxed, but unfortunately, many, many remain in place. And then we saw the development of vaccines. And um, you know, we've seen some countries exporting vaccines only to then close their market once they realized that they needed those vaccines for their own people. 
um, there are efforts now through COVAX and, you know, the United States and other countries are announcing vaccines that they will be shipping to other countries, but most countries are making it clear that at least until their populations are vaccinated, they are not going to be kind of opening up their vaccines, you know, for unlimited um, export potential. Um, but I think what COVID has shown is that we need a global solution. I mean, not everyone makes everything. And even for example, if you export vaccines, countries need to have the related materials they need to make the vaccines. And so if there are export restrictions on those materials, then you can't manufacture the vaccines. And different countries produce a lot of this stuff. No one makes all of it. And so, you know, I think what it's shown, we're all kind of joined at the hip, whether we like it or not. And to find a solution to the overall COVID problem, let's just remember there, this is a global problem. And until we, we address it um, from a global perspective, um, you know, we're not gonna be getting back to a post COVID world. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I, I think it really is interesting to sort of move forward in a new administration um, and, and sort of a, a new setting as, as we think about some of these issues. Um, so I want to go to one of the questions from our, our audience. Um, and uh, Jean-Francois Botin has a, a very pointed question, which is, aren't narrow trade initiatives without congressional approval just what the Trump administration did? Um, and that's, that's a very pointed way of putting this, but I think he's really getting at a, a deeper issue. You alluded to it a little earlier when you talked about narrow sectoral trade deals that don't need congressional approval. Um, how does it, how does US trade policy look going forward in an era where it is almost impossible to get congressional approval on effectively any trade deal thanks to hostility from, from both the left and the right? As, as you noted earlier, US MCA may have been unique, it may have been, uh, it may not be a good precedent because it was very different from some of the trade deals we're, we're trying to achieve in Asia. And I'm just curious how you see trade um, in this sort of no major deal possible environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would, you know, I, I remind people that, you know, until recently, the WTO or its predecessor, the GATT, negotiations of those organizations were big multi-issue trade agreements called rounds, right? And there was one single undertaking at the end. And we saw when the Doha, Doha round was launched, you know, 10 years later, people realized it was going nowhere. So I think just the same way that the international um, global community can no longer do a big round, I think that these mega trade agreements, at least for certain countries like the United States, are just not in the cards for now. So then the question is, well, then you just put up your hands and you say, we're not going to do anything. And in my view, that's not a good solution. And I think these narrow sectoral deals, and I'll admit they're not ideal, they don't allow for trade-offs. Um, they can raise questions with respect to WTO compatibility. Um, sometimes they may not be enforceable and have dispute settlement. They're not perfect, but you know, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And again, I think engagement for the United States on trade is essential. And uh, you know, to be realistic, I think you know, a, a, a pragmatic way forward is to kind of shoot smaller and hope that you can build some momentum. And over time, if you then also pursue needed domestic measures, you build the support back up for um, you know, being engaged in a bigger way on trade globally. Yeah, and perhaps we have an, an excellent follow-up question here actually from, from Lauren Moriarty, which is which sectors in the Asia Pacific region do you see as ripe for these sectoral trade deals? Uh, where would you focus if you were the Biden administration? Digital trade by far is the low hanging fruit here. And for a number of reasons, there, there are a number of already agreements that have been concluded or, or negotiations underway. Um, second, the United States has already agreed to high level digital trade principles, uh, excuse me, agreements with Japan and through the USMCA. And third, I think that digital trade also um, provides a real opening for pursuing a worker centric trade policy. And why do I say that? Because in a digital trade agreement, you can include 
provisions on digital inclusiveness, getting your population more digitally connected, which COVID has shown is so critical. Um, second, I also think through a digital trade agreement, you can have robust kind of trade facilitation provisions that allow small and medium sized enterprises, which, you know, many of which are either women owned or minority owned, get into the trade game. And this doesn't mean just selling their products online, but it means e-invoicing, it means e-payments, it means e-marketing. And I think this just opens up a whole new avenue um, for the for trade and and you know more of our citizens from small companies to be engaged in international trade in a big way, which I also think can help build support for um, you know global trade rules and globe and U.S. engagement in the global trade landscape. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And we, we actually did have another question on, on public opinion. Um, but first, I wanted to ask, there's a great question in the in the chat from Eric Churchill, who wants to ask you what your views are on climate friendly trade policies of the kind that have been advocated by the European Union and by the Biden administration. And he wonders if you think they're likely to take off. And if so, you know, what would their impact be on trade, particularly in the Asia Pacific? Right. So I said early on, I mean, part of the Biden trade policy right now is helping to promote and complement efforts of the larger Biden agenda. And let's be honest, climate change is front and center of, of um, Biden po overall policy and trade plays an important role here. Now it's unclear to me at this point how ambitious the United States is going to be on the climate and trade front. Um, I know that, you know, they're, they're, they have been considering issues, um, you know, various different policy proposals, including um, this um, carbon border adjustment measures. Um, and that's something we'll have to see where they come out on that. I mean, this is something that the EU is way ahead of us on. I think there is concern if the EU goes forward too quickly um, we may end up with another bilateral irritant at a time when we're trying to de-escalate tensions between the U.S. and the EU. So my hope would be that as we figure out what we want to do on trade and climate, that early on we, we engage with our allies and partners and other like-minded countries um, to make sure that we're all moving in the same direction. But again, I think the trade component of climate change is critical, and I suspect that's going to be an area where we're going to see a lot of activity over the next few years. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned this as another possible irritant in the European-US relationship, um, because we've seen um, several incidents recently, and, and Noel Clahane in the chat um, you know, has, has a question about the CAI with China um, and whether this has done damage to the transatlantic relationship more generally. And I think this, this goes back to some of what you were talking about with, with Nick earlier about the ways in which trade policy with allies and partners does not always line up with other foreign policy priorities with those states. Um, so I'd love to get your take on this question. Um, has the European Union done real damage to its relationship with the US by pursuing this deal with China, then sort of backing away um, and wherever we are now with that deal. Kind of unclear yeah, where we are now, but I think this just shows that Europe is just grappling with a lot of serious China issues. There are differences among the member states on how to proceed. Um, I never thought the, the comprehensive agreement on investment, you know, was, was kind of a, a nail in the coffin for US for transatlantic cooperation on China, I viewed it more as a setback. Um, but now it seems that China has almost done the United States a favor by um, imposing disproportional sanctions on the EU, including EU parliamentarians who would have to approve this deal. Um, and as a result, it looks like, at least for now, the EU is suspending efforts to build support for this agreement. But I don't think the story is over on the CAI. Um, we'll have to see how things shake out in Europe um, over the coming months. But um, I, I'm hopeful that you know, during the president's upcoming trip to Europe, 
that we're going to see more transatlantic cooperation, not just on China, but really on an affirmative agenda, uh, because there's lots of things we should be working with Europe on in lockstep um, to kind of help shape the rules, the norms, the standards um, for the global trade and investment landscape going forward. Perhaps that's a good segue into the question of existing norms and, and institutions. So we saw a really concerted effort during the Trump administration to undermine the WTO's um, dispute mechanism. Um, and, and I'm curious how you see the Biden administration um, approaching that topic going forward. What, what is the role of the WTO and these dispute mechanisms, uh, dispute settlement mechanisms that have sort of recently come under, under scrutiny? Do you think the Biden administration is going to recommit to the WTO um, or is it going to continue to pursue a somewhat Trumpian path on that topic? Well, the Biden team has been pretty clear about wanting to play a leadership and a very constructive role in the WTO. I was heartened to see one of its first actions was to lift the US blocking of the Director General. And now Director General Ngozi is up and running in the WTO. Um, she's quite, a, I call an energizer bunny and kind of shaking things up and trying to move things forward. And the US has been very supportive of her efforts, whether it be on COVID related issues or on the fish subsidies negotiations. So I think these aren't just words by the Biden administration. I think they're clearly interested in trying to use the WTO to address, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, the emerging issues um, on trade. That said, we all need to be realistic about the WTO. I mean, it's, it's, it has some serious problems and I think we're really at a point the next year, during the next year or so, where we'll, we'll know, can the WTO really step up to these challenges or is it gonna become less and less relevant? A strong dispute settlement mechanism has always been a key and unique feature of the WTO. It's broken now, largely due um, to efforts by the Trump administration to disband the number of judges on the appellate body. But we all need to remember that problem didn't start with Trump. In fact, it started um, earlier. And I remember when I worked for the Obama administration, we had serious concerns with the appellate body. So it's going to take some time to fix. What I would hope, though, is that whenever the United States, at least through my career, you know, had a problem with something, it put concrete suggestions on the table on how to fix the problem. And this is something we haven't done with respect to dispute settlement and the appellate body. We've kind of sat back and said, no, nope, not good enough. No, we don't like that, as other countries have really tried to address our concerns. So I would hope that we would be able to come forward in writing with the types of fixes we would need to, to repair and restore the appellate body. I note that the that um, the European Commission in its paper about a month ago had a long annex on the WTO, and I think it's moving a bit on the appellate body as well. And when you kind of read some of the details in the, in their paper, so um, again, I would hope that we would find a way to revive this this mechanism. But it's going to take time. This isn't something that's going to be. It, it took a long time for it to unwind. Um, I think it's going to take some time to build it back together. Great, and, and perhaps that's not a bad note to end on, as, as with so many things in foreign policy, trade policy, the Trump, <laughs> the Trump administration broke a lot of China, and the Biden administration hopefully may offer some solutions to some of them. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Evan Cooper to provide us with some closing remarks. But um, thank you to you all for your questions, and, and to you, Wendy, for, for answering them so well. My pleasure, thank you. Well, thank you, Emma, and thank you to both Wendy and Nick for speaking with us today. As, as Wendy said, engagement on trade for the US is essential. And this is one of the many policy areas that the New American Engagement Initiative is doing work in advancing new ideas for US engagement with the rest of the world. So please keep an eye out for our next event in the Future Foreign Policy series, as well as for upcoming reports. We just released one on vaccine diplomacy, and we'll have new reports on the US military presence in the Middle East, energy security and decarbonization, as well as many other issues for the US taking different fresh approaches to foreign policy. 
thank you all so much for tuning in and have a good rest of your day.